Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. So, Danny, All right. I, you have had, like, an impossibly busy summer, man. I certainly have, yeah. You know, look, I'm, I'm in this weird position. I think I've said it on the show before, where the worse the world is, the more it is, like, almost positive for my writing. Because, I mean, I literally cannot keep up with the news cycle. And so, American Empire at home and abroad, it's just spinning out of control with story after story and tragedy after tragedy. And, you know, I just feel an obligation to comment on all of it, but I'll tell you, I'm, I, I, I don't, I mean, I, I lack the time and the energy to hit everything. And so, you know, the pod is great because we get to throw around ideas and, you know, touch on a bunch of things, but man, I'll, I'll tell you, I could spend my whole day writing and doing interviews and I still miss some stuff. <laughs> Can, uh, congrats on uh, finishing out your truth dig series. Yeah, the history series. Oh man, what a labor of love uh, that obviously was. It's a, uh, I think it's a great series. We're gonna put it in. A, we're gonna make it into a book. Um, you know, it's it's just an alternative look at American history from a, a more leftist and sort of more um, bottom up grassroots perspective, right? Rather than a history of the elite. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping it. I'm hoping it sells and some people actually pay attention because uh, I think we're in dire need of of that kind of history. You know. Um, that said, you know, one thing Americans ignore is, is our more recent history. And, and today we're, we're lucky to have somebody on the pod, a, a really close friend of mine, Ryan Keene, who, um, you know, he, was, he lived the history, right? He lived recent history uh, in Iraq and then uh, the, the, the tragic history of veterans since then, which is, of course, going to go on. So I want to introduce Ryan real quick. And um, so, uh, you know, he's born and raised in Ohio. Uh, that's where he's coming to us from. Um, you know, as for military service, he served in the Ohio, Ohio Army National Guard from 2002 to 8. He had deployment with uh, Task Force 134 at the High Value Detainee Site at Camp Cropper in Baghdad, Iraq, uh, where he was from January to December 2005. Uh, today, he's a proud stay-at-home father. He's got three amazing children. Um, he's 100% uh, disabled with the VA. Uh, he has a PTSD. And he's been struggling with that in and out of treatment since 2006, which I think all of us on the pod know something about. Uh, he's an advocate of peer support locally for mental health issues. He's a, a member, a fellow member with me, uh, well, all of us, of About Face since 2017. That's Veterans Against the War. It came out of Iraq Veterans Against the War, which was formed in 2004. He participated in the national convention there uh, in Seattle last year and uh, in San Antonio this year, uh, as well as uh, took part in the Veterans Day action for About Face in Philadelphia. He's trying to start his own chapter of About Face in Ohio, which uh, hopefully he has success with. And, uh, you know, the thing to know about him is he's an anti-war activist, an anti-imperialist poet. I, reckon, I recommend you check out his work. And a writer who is a contributor to the Peace Report by a fellow About Face member, Will Griffin. So, Ryan, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Danny. And um, thanks, everyone on Fortress on the Hill for having me on. Um, I just wanted to give a brief overview of my experience um, in the Ohio Army National Guard, specifically with my 12 months in Baghdad, Iraq, from January 2005 to December 2005. So I was in the Ohio Army National Guard from 2002 to 2008. Um, when I joined, I was a 19 kilo, which was an M1A1 Abrams tanker crewman. Um, I was a part of an armored cavalry unit, which was mostly made up of tankers, as well as some infantry mortarmen 
and um, headquarters. Um, so we got orders to deploy for Operation Iraqi Freedom in the summer of 2004. And um, as a group of tankers and infantry mortarmen who um, had Bradleys, we were told we weren't taking our tanks and that we'd be on a borrowed Humvees being a combat security company doing route security. So we went to Fort Dix, New Jersey for Primo and we trained for route security um, as well as MAUT, which um, is urban, urbanized warfare training. And the entire time we landed right after into Kuwait and I went to Camp Virginia, Kuwait. Um, we still, everybody wasn't sure where we were going to be stationed and there were some weird vibes going on. Nobody really was clear on our mission yet. So we ended up going to Baghdad at a little gray site called uh, Camp Cropper, which was Iraq's HVD facility. A uh, high value detainee. And it was basically one of the three Iraq main prisons of Camp Cropper, Buka, and Abu Ghraib. Now, in 2004, Abu Ghraib was made um, infamous with the war crimes committed there that nobody but some untrained, um, isolated, and de individualized enlisted people were punished for it. Um, Philip Zimbardo is somebody I recommend, specifically Psychology of Evil, which um, he was an expert witness and worked with mental health with some of the Abu Ghraib um, corrections officers that committed these crimes. Now, instead of having more oversight and more cameras, both visual and audio, when I arrived in Camp Cropper, like maybe I'd expect after these horrendous war crimes were released to the public, um, thankfully. There was actually a zero photography, um, zero video, audio um, order on our camp. So none of us, our company was in charge of Camp Cropper, both tower guards, as well as the corrections officers and um, escorts and all the things. Um, unless you were on the task force 134 list, you did not get onto Camp Cropper. And if you did get onto Camp Cropper, you would not have any audio or video capabilities. So now as an untrained and confused um, group of tankers and cab scouts and infantry mortarmen, combat arms unit. Um, we are in charge of the high value detainees in Iraq in 2005. Um, just a couple brief things I will mention about my experience. So there was a gentleman named Cyrus Carr. He was of Persian descent. He was an American citizen and a veteran of the US Navy. Um, he had gotten clearance through the FBI and the State Department to do a documentary because he was a filmmaker on Cyrus the Great, who he's named after. So the U.S. government knew fully well that he was in Iraq to film this documentary. And um, within weeks of him being in country in both Iran and Iraq, he was pulled over at a checkpoint um, him and his cameraman, they um, were in a taxi, just a regular city taxi guy that they had no connection with. Well, they found one washer and dryer timer, which at the time um, was a big thing for IEDs, allegedly. And um, so they instantly all were bagged and tagged, taken to Abu Ghraib, 
the minute um, any American citizen that was detained in Iraq at the time, the minute it was found out at Abu Ghraib or Bukha, you were instantly sent to us at Camp Cropper. So we came across numerous American citizens, most of whom were ended up through a long and unconstitutional process released and found guilty of no crimes. Just being in a random taxi and then finding one timer gets you sent to Abu Ghraib and a black bag over your head as an American citizen and a US Navy veteran. Um, another thing I would like to mention is the American Red Crescent and Red Cross were the only NGO um, that was allowed access to our prison. However, we were given notice of this and um, the only way for them to correspond with family, legal counsel, embassies, um, friends, anyway, is through American Red Crescent and Red Cross letters. Well, there's no video or audio surveillance in the camp. So if a corrections officer gets a letter, I mean, nine out of 10 times it's getting burnt with a lighter. I mean, just horrendous things like these, you know. So um, that's just a little bit of my story and why I don't understand, you know, why the impeachment um, seems to come up when, you know, an elite Democrat or Republican goes after and another elite Democrat or Republican, but never after all these war crimes that happen after president, after president on both sides. So that's, that's an interesting point, you know, and you recently contributed mightily to my article that was entitled um, Impeach All the Presidents. Actually, I wanted to title it Impeach the System, Not Trump. But, you know, you contributed mightily to it because that morning when I was sitting outside the gym, you know, we were texting back and forth about, you know, Pelosi's impeachment announcement the day before. And you had some interesting things to say, and, and you've, you've hinted at it, and I want to expand on that. You know, you say how you don't understand why this, you know, attack on Biden, this, this in, inter-mainstream partisan problem is, is, is now the genesis for impeachment, whereas other things weren't. So, you know, expand on that a little bit and then, and then kind of let the listeners know what your concerns are about the United States and the Democratic Party specifically pursuing this uh, pursuing this impeachment, which will probably cloud out other other things. Okay, so I've just been um, thinking about just in recent history. I mean, this is I'm sure been going on much longer than this. Uh, you know, if you know anything about General Smedley Butler, Butler. Um, but so, for instance, the last president that was um, out, well, other than Bill Clinton that had risk of impeachment, but he resigned was Richard Nixon. He wasn't brought for impeachment for the genocides in Cambodia or Laos that he was illegally committing in the war crimes, but he was brought to impeachment over spying on the mainstream corporate Democrat, you know, the, the war hawk in sheep's clothing. And then, you know, with George W. Bush, Nancy Pelosi said in 2004 that pursuing George W. Bush for impeachment for war crimes committed in Iraq and Afghanistan would be a waste of time. I mean, this is documented. Um, the reason I believe nobody impeaches for war crimes, you know, President Obama, drone attacks, killing American citizens without due process through drones, um, starting to intermingle under Obama with Yemen's genocide, and then Trump, the continued genocide in Yemen and working with the Saudis. Now, the common theme through all of this is they don't want to impeach for actual war crimes, which have been happening for decades upon decades on both sides of the parties, because they're all complicit in war crimes through the military industrial complex, the imperialism, 
which is run through capitalism and nationalism, you know, and the Democrats are just as guilty as the Republicans because, you know, Joe Biden, his son, Hunter Biden, you know, he's making $50,000 a month from one of the Ukrainian fascist oligarchs, natural gas companies. Um, Biden Inc., which came out by Politico, does a really in-depth study of, you know, the lobbyist firms in foreign countries, specifically Ukraine, that Joe Biden's brother and sons are a part of, you know? The crowd strike comment by Trump. I mean, this is all, this is all the elites of the two parties battling it out, but they won't battle it out for the people of the world that are, you know, getting stomped on for resources in megalomaniac geopolitics. I mean, that's really some great points that you're making that's just totally lost on mainstream media. You know, there's a reason that the stuff that I write and that you contribute to and we all do ends up on, you know, alt-left or alt-libertarian sites, which are great, but they just don't crack the mainstream, you know. This is really an intra-family uh, dispute is what I think I'm hearing from you. And and the family is the Democratic and Republican establishment who they may argue at Thanksgiving, but ultimately they're brothers and sisters, right? They're ultimately they're a family affair. And so you're right. We're not talking about war crimes. So why not? Well, let's say we decided to impeach Trump for his, you know, continued unilateral imperial presidency support for Saudi Arabia and the genocide in Yemen. Well, if you, if you, bring up that dirty laundry, you then have to remember it's going to come up that Obama started it. And everyone loves Obama, right? The Democratic Party is the party of Obama in some way, or it was. And that's what the establishment likes. And so, you know, you can't bring up impeachment for war crimes because back through at least Lyndon Johnson, if not earlier, Democrats and Republicans have been guilty of a lot of the same imperial extra constitutional behavior without any congressional approval in many cases. So I, mean, I think it's a great point bringing up. And, you know, it's, it's ultimately incredibly, incredibly obtuse for Pelosi to suddenly act like she has the moral high ground over this Ukraine scandal, because clearly there's so much more to it, including, like you mentioned, the corruption of the Biden family, the uh, vacuousness of focusing on, you know, politics as the reason to impeach rather than true war crimes but uh you know uh, what, what do you guys think when you hear about this henry and keegan well the the interesting thing ryan Grimm from the intercept brought up a really interesting point about the impeachment saying that the main reason why she's finally taking it up now is because a lot of those democrats that in the house that weren't a hundred percent for it are worried about getting primaried from the left So there's this, so they were the ones that were knocking on her door being like, Hey, we have to, um, we have to take this up because like, this is the straw that's breaking the camel's back basically. And so a lot of people were afraid for their own seats instead of, you know, that this just goes to the party politics thing of people being like, Oh, well, I'm going to lose my seat. So I need to get behind this because a lot of people in our base are behind this. And so Nancy Pelosi finally felt like she had the backing and the, the um, political capital to go forward with this. So it's, it's, an, it's annoying because it's not even like necessarily about the substance of the matter. It's more just, oh, we finally have the votes to, to like make this impactful. So now she's taking it up. Can, can I quickly interject oh, just one last thing I forgot to mention? Yeah. Um, so, well, I, I mean, the reason they don't want to, you know, bring up war crimes, let's say on the example of bring up Trump for impeachment for work with the Saudis and genocide in Yemen and Obama as well and the illegal drone strikes and the start of Yemen genocide. Well, the Clinton Foundation has direct donations from the Saudi royal family as they're sending arms sales to Saudi Arabia more than any other country in the world. You know, the, you follow the money in these imperialist capitalist societies, 
because the corporate, you know, the corporate puppet masters are the ones that are pulling these strings of the figurehead corporate mainstream Republican and Democrat taking super PAC money, um, specifically after, you know, Citizens United. It's a shame. Absolutely. I, uh, one, one thing that I've been, I've been noticing is, and, and you guys tell me if it's been the same for you, it, the use of the word whistleblower has suddenly had a, has a positive connotation now, <laughs> you know, pr- prior, prior to this news cycle, whistleblower, <laughs> the media was whistleblower equals leaker. You know, they wouldn't say it. You wouldn't hear it on CBS this morning that someone was a whistleblower. You would hear that they were a leaker under the Espionage Act. Why is it that Chelsea Manning, or Reality Winner, Daniel Hale, or Ed Snowden, why didn't they get this kind of treatment from the media when they were actual whistleblowers contributing to finding out the horrors that we're all talking about right now? It, it, yeah, it, oh, just, it makes my ears want to turn inside out. That's amazing. That's beautiful, Brother Henry. I mean, you're, well, you're so right. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting, like, so the way this dude went about it, right, he went through the proper channels of going to the inspector general and then it going up at other levels into the places where they finally had to cross um, from the straight up CIA realm into going into the White House. And that's where they, they get, it kept getting held up. So even at the, at like, and James Risen just talked about this in the last Intercepted, you know, he was like, there was so many people trying to suppress his complaint that somebody finally had to say something about it to the media. And that's really more what got it, again, what got it pushed. It wasn't that going through proper channels in this manner is never going to work on its own because there's always going to be the people who are trying to stop it. Because it's going to make them look embarrassed. I would like to also add to all of that, that the reason why this whistleblower is given all the admiration by the mainstream media and the corporate media is because once again, this is a crime against, uh, this is a whistleblower for corporations and imperialists. Mm -hmm. This is an elite. This is not a whistleblower of actual war crimes, just like they won't impeach war crimes. They will not consider real, actual war crime whistleblowers, um, you know, given their constitutional rights to be whistleblowers. You know, I, I think, you know, I'm the last guy who likes taking the position of defending Trump, but I think part of what determines how you're treated as a whistleblower is who you blow the whistle on. And so the, the crime ultimately of Manning and Snowden was that they had the audacity to blow the whistle on the Obama administration, the, you know, mainstream, highly respected among, you know, liberals, quote unquote, Obama administration. And the thing that's happening right now is the Democrats who run the House are so veritably obsessed with Trump. They're so reflexively anti-Trump that suddenly they're willing to listen to a whistleblower, treat a whistleblower with respect because it's against someone they don't like. Because Trump, for all his crimes, he is an outsider in a way. And neither the mainstream Democrats or most of the mainstream Republicans at root have a lot of respect for the guy. You know, I think that if this whistleblower were to come out and said the same thing about a call Obama had made, it would not have gotten as good of a treatment, especially from like MSNBC and CNN, which are really Obama networks. And so I think that this is a huge, huge point that you're bringing up, Brian, and and that you're bringing up, Keegan, that, you know, we don't really respect whistleblowers. Obama put more of them behind jail under the Espionage Act than all presidents combined since 1917 when the act was passed by Woodrow Wilson. So I think that we're all on the same page that this, look, I think the impeachment thing is a canard. I think it's a charade. It's a political game. It's an entertainment mechanism that's going to increase media ratings, but it's certainly not 
in the interests of the American people. You know, Snowden released, you know, he, he blew the whistle on things that were crimes against the American people being, you know, full scale surveillance. Right. Uh, and, you know, Chelsea Manning, even more so spoke out in the name of the American people when she said, look, like not just the American people, but the Iraqi people and the Afghan people. She was saying, look at these war crimes that are being hidden from you. But that was a crime. They were both treated as criminals. They still are. Chelsea Manning served one of the longest federal prison sentences ever meted out to a leaker or a whistleblower. And this whole impeachment thing, is, it's, it's a joke. And, and the people, unfortunately, the people of America are going to get caught up in it. You know, they're, they're going to get tied into it. It's going to be all, all day news 24-7 for the next year, maybe. And what we're not going to talk about is, hey, the Afghan anniversary, uh, our 18th full year of being there, entering our 19th year is about to come up. I and mean, that won't get 150th of the coverage of the latest tweet from Trump about the whistleblower or the latest, you know, uh, action taken by Adam Schiff or, uh, you know, Nancy Pelosi. So I, I just think this is such an important topic for our listeners to pay attention to, you know, as we as we sort of transition to to other headlines for the day. You know, I just, I just want to emphasize, re-emphasize how right Ryan is to bring up these points. And, and it really did inspire me to write, you know, one of my more uh, clicked on, one of my more read articles on this, you know, impeachment uh, charade. The guys and I love doing the podcast, being able to share our experiences in the military with allies and supporters means the world to us, but we can't do all the work. We need you to share an episode of ours with somebody, anyone whom you think might be affected by it. Maybe a young person looking to join the military or parents advocating for one, uh, conscientious citizens who care about the violence the U.S. wages in their name advocates for women and people of color who understand the harsh environment the military can create for minorities and also inflicts on minorities across the globe and anyone else you think it might affect please take a minute and share this with them now our podcast is supported in a few different ways first there's patreon where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping the guys and i pay for some of the podcast's expenses Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help us keep going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and other crap I can't think of right now. So let's bring out these honorary producers, and they are Will Arends, Gage Counts, Fahim Shirazi, Henry Zamoda, James O'Barr, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you very much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash fortress on a hill or please check out our store on spreadshirt the great bill Kropinski did an awesome job designing our first shirt which you can find at shop.spreadshirt.com forward slash fortress on a hill check for promo codes before you order and now let's get back to the podcast So now I want to tell you guys a little story. Um, During my second tour in Iraq, uh, I was introduced to these massive, massive surveillance towers 
that had cameras capable of seeing at least a mile away in perfect resolution. It may have been further than that. I can't remember the exact specs. But it allowed the, uh, the Marine Corps units, I was a, a squad of Army MPs with the, stationed with the Battalion of Marines um, in our area to see a great amount of their patrol area without having to send people to actually observe it. Your patrols don't have to be there. They can see down certain streets or certain hot spots. And um, Iraq itself is mostly a really flat and desert area of the world, aside from the north, um, which only added to the range of the towers. There was a day in 2008 where my squad was blocking off a road after finding a roadside bomb. And we sat there for I don't know how many hours waiting for EOD to arrive and, and defuse the device. And <clears throat> despite my truck being only parked a few hundred meters from the bomb, I couldn't actually see the bomb myself. But you know who could see the bomb? The giant marine tower back on our camp behind me. Um, they knew that uh, they knew that the EOD techs were going to blow it up before I did. I remember it was pitch black. It got to like 11 or 11:30 at night, and all of a sudden there's just this huge ball of fire in the air. And I'm like, oh yeah, they told us they were going to blow. We 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 didn't let you know. So uh, I think nobody was close enough to get hurt or anything like that. But uh, yeah, that that really pissed me off. I tell this story because of a new report from the Intercept detailing how towers like these are going to become the norm along the U.S. southern border, except these new towers are 10 years more advanced and far more powerful. Uh, Customs and Border Protection plans to build uh, 10 of them across a particular area of the border in Arizona where the Tejano Odham Nation's Reservation sits. They're described as, quote, 160-foot surveillance tower capable of continuously monitoring every person and vehicle within a radius of up to 7.5 miles. The tower will be outfitted with high-definition cameras with night vision, thermal sensors, and ground-sweeping radar, all of which will feed real-time data to Border Patrol agents at a central operating station in Ajo, Arizona. The system will store an archive with the ability to rewind and track individuals' movements across time, an ability known as wide area persistent surveillance. And the contractors doing the work at the border, they belong to an outfit called Elbit Systems. They are Israel's largest military co contractor. And you're never going to guess where those towers and surveillance systems were first tested and installed in the Gaza Strip. The Palestinian people have been living under this particular security nightmare where their homeland is both physically and digitally occupied every day, all day. And now part of that nightmare is coming to our southern border. Now, keeping all that in mind, add that to this next headline here. An NSA targeting system known as Real-Time Regional Gateway, or RTRG, created and honed on America's many battlefields, including Iraq and Afghanistan, has helped connect NSA data with both American intel activities on far off battlefields and intel from American allies. NSA analysts here in the U.S. can immediately sift through intel from multiple American allies and their activities on the battlefield and vice versa. Guess which federal agency is now using this exact tracking system on our southern border? It's ICE. ICE uses this tool, they say, to combat drug smuggling and human trafficking, both horrible acts to be sure, but should they be fought using the same kind of intelligence capabilities we bring to our ostensible enemies overseas? The article from The Intercept on this topic makes it clear that countries using this system have no way of knowing how their intelligence is being used by allies in the furtherance of their own combat goals. And the same goes for American law enforcement agencies trying to use this intelligence. There are lots of parts to this narrative that are really horrifying. But today I'd like you guys to only focus on one. Military technology always comes home. A weapon or system built for one purpose often ends up elsewhere being used entirely differently. While certainly these headlines are not the only examples, 
they are certainly dyed in the wool want, uh, examples of how these chickens will always come home to roost. We as Americans need to understand this more than anyone else in the world. Can you know, I about this? I, but please, go, go ahead, Ryan. Okay, I was just going to say um, that was great, Henry. What I got from that as I'm listening is, okay, the military tech, you know, made in the Gaza Strip, corporations over people, you know, free Palestine. Um, there's a great new documentary called Gaza Fights for Freedom done by Abby Martin and Mike Preisner of the Empire Files. And, um, you know, it's about the um, great march of the return. And basically, you know, we'd rather have military contracts with military industrial complex industries and corporate elites on both sides um, over there making this technology to bring home to the South. Now, the immigration problem, you know, let's talk about the Monroe, Do ever since the Monroe Doctrine, we've been doing corporate imperialism all through Latin America. You know, this country was founded as an imperialist country when Christopher Columbus started committing genocide on indigenous people all over North America, you know? And um, even before that, the Spanish Inquisition in Latin America. I mean, it's, it's insane to me that people don't see the military industrial complex run by these corporations and elitists, which fund your mainstream Democrat and mainstream Republican, they control all the puppet strings all around the world. And it comes down to corporations and profits over people. And that's why um, a people's movement, you know, a proletarian movement is needed. You know, I've written a lot about empire coming home. I've even titled more than one article as the empire comes home or this is what happens when empire comes home. And normally I write about surveillance uh, on American people. Uh, often I talk about the border and uh, Henry's headlines here combine both. And, and I think we have to start to be honest with ourselves about what occurs when you fight counterinsurgencies or whatever you want to call these terror wars since 9-11. When you fight these for two decades, it is historically inevitable that the technology and the tactics applied against foreign, usually brown folks, will inevitably boomerang back to the United States and be used first against our communities of color, whether they be urban ghettos or uh, border refugee communities. And eventually after that, it'll come back on all of us, as we saw with like the Snowden allegations or the, the Snowden leaks, where we found out, wow, like even if, even if you're a white Christian male, you, you're still being targeted by the NSA. Whoa. You know, that got people to have some pause. You mentioned that Israel, of course, is complicit in all this. I mean, Israel has become the model. The surveillance and the occupation and the imprisonment of Palestinians in the West Bank and especially in the Gaza Strip, that is what America has become. It's the model for American behavior on the border. Mexico, right? And everything south of the Rio Grande is the Gaza Strip and West Bank, so far as we're concerned. That's the enemy. Anyone on that side is the enemy. So surveilling them, brutalizing them, arresting them, dividing them from their children, that's all okay. And, it, and, and ICE is really just a domestic arm of the U.S. military and of the U.S. national security, national security intelligence state. And... We need to be banging the drums because, you know, a famous uh, writer who escapes me was talking about, you know, Nazi Germany and saying how nobody stood up when different groups were, you know, um, attacked, killed, imprisoned by the Nazis. And, and this writer said something to the effect of, you know, um, first they came for the communists, you know, the Nazis came for the communists. And I didn't say anything 
because I wasn't a communist, you know. And then they came for the socialists, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't a socialist. And and uh, then they came for the Jews, and, and, and I didn't speak up because I wasn't Jewish. And when they then came for me, there was no one left to speak up for me. And that's how I feel we have to treat the most marginalized communities among us, whether they be peoples of color within the states or peoples of color, migrants and refugees, uh, in many cases from U.S.-backed wars and U.S.-backed oppression. We need to stand with the least among us, like Christ might have said, hint, hint. Uh, <laughs> Because if we don't, there's going to be no one left to speak up for the rest of us. And it's just the right thing to do, of course. <sighs> Absolutely. I, I think the, um, the mission creep is really interesting just because, uh, you know, NSA has, um, they, you know, they basically work everywhere. And so when you have somebody that uses something in theater, of course, it's going to be shared with the other agencies or the other parts of the agency, right? So, like we have a um, we have a, a NSA facility in Texas in San Antonio, and you know, mainly they are about like drug interdiction or whatever, just like monitoring things. But I I can only imagine with everything that's been going on and the push from the administration, I can only imagine that they are being used for other purposes, or as we're seeing, they are being used for other purposes, at least the technology. And the way that information sharing has become so um, so easy these days, uh, it's, it's so easy. To, and it, that's, that's what's so scary to me about the RTRG program being used on the border is that you have, you have low, law enforcement and ICE officials who maybe don't have the clearance to look at the at the the products that are being made, they they help they'll have liaisons from the NSA that can basically relay the information to them uh, in real time, and that's like that's really scary because again, as you said, Danny, like where does this go? Like this this can only get worse, especially if if that part of the program, which I think is has the most potential to be really damaging to American uh, constitutional rights, you know, is the fact that like if they, what if they started giving it to police departments, you know, or state agencies that were, you know, that they deemed necessary. Like that's, that's pretty scary stuff. And it's, it's worth considering that it could be a really big problem. Yeah. And on top, in addition to what Keegan just said about, you know, it, the, the trickle down of the military industrial complex Okay, and this military technology has been filtering after the massive amount of, um, you know, tanks and Humvees and assault rifles and all these things that were made for the the false flag, you know, war on terror. Um, they've trickled down to the communities. I mean, after the police murdered um, Michael Brown and Ferguson. You know, it looked like it looked like a, a war zone. I mean, with and these are just local law enforcement. A lot of who have PTSD and have been traumatized either by veteran services or by you know being a law enforcement officer and um, some of the traumatizing circumstances you come across. And these corporations, instead of investing and protecting people and maybe investing in some mental health. No, they, they'd rather invest in these corporations and these military industrial complex industries. Um, and it trickles all through the private community too. You know, it's mass incarceration and mass surveillance. It's, it's insidious. You know, and, and I'm going to tie this to Trump <laughs> somehow. It seems like you can always tie everything to but think about his base, right? His base, we're told again and again, and I think it's partly true, is the disgruntled white working class, right? So what do we know? And this ties into the military industrial complex. Why is it so hard to stop, you know, militarized policing? Why is it so hard to stop mass incarceration? Why is it so hard to stop the abuse of migrants at the border? Well, it's hard to stop because it is a money-making machine. And it is a money-making machine that obviously most of the profits go to the corporations, but some of the pay, it's rather modest, but some of the pay 
goes to that very white working class, many of whom are veterans, because what are deindustrialization crippled unions. It crippled well-paid manufacturing jobs with benefits that mostly the white working class had benefited from, often at the exclusion of people of color, but that's another issue. Well, who still employs the white working class, many of whom are veterans? I'll tell you who. ICE, local police forces, and prisons, prison guards. Did you know that prison guard unions, especially in New York State but elsewhere, are some of the most powerful lobbying organizations in their state, in this country, because they want more prisons built because it's an employment issue for them. The white working class has to work somewhere, and there's no longer much being made in this country since we've handed most of our uh, manufacturing jobs overseas and sold out the working class of all colors. You know, it's really, really hard to close a prison. It's really, really hard to shut down ICE, and it's really, really hard to downsize the militarization of police because it's an employment mechanism and it's massive profits for the military industrial complex. This, this is the refuse of empire. And, and I'm really glad we talked about this thing. Let's not, you know, forget this is all, whether it's the new uh, proxy wars that have been private privatized with um, contracts going out to KBR and Halliburton and everybody else, or the privatization of the mass incarceration of the United States in these private for-profit prisons. They need to be shut down immediately. Absolutely. So I'm, yeah, go ahead, Henry. Oh, no, I'm good, eh? So I'm going to pivot us once more to our final headline of the day. Um, and it's all related and it's all depressing. You know, there are days where I wonder, is this good for me? I mean, the, like personally, like the writing and the podcast and the speaking, like there are days where I get pretty low. And I'm sure everyone on the pod right now, right, all four of us can probably relate to this. There are days when I feel low because I don't tell good stories. I don't tell happy tales. I don't talk about happy things. You know, some days I do two or three interviews in a day and when it's over, I feel more exhausted than when I ran like, you know, 10 miles when I was in the army, it's the exhaustion of it. But, but I would be remiss. We would be remiss if today, you know, when this comes out in early October, 2019, the United States will be celebrating for uh, an interesting euphemism, celebrating, commemorating the beginning of the 19th year of its war in Afghanistan. Let that sink in for a minute. 19 years at war in one country. Longest war in American history. Before that, it was the Philippine-American War or the Philippine-American Massacre where we destroyed one-sixth, killed one-sixth of the population in that country. I just wrote about that. No one remembers. Done the same thing to Afghanistan. So what's happening around this 19th or 18-year anniversary, the beginning of the 19th year of U.S. involvement in Afghanistan? Well, we had Afghan elections just recently. We don't know who won yet. We never seem to know. It takes about three weeks to have a winner in Afghanistan. It's a pretty antiquated voting system. Uh, what's certain is it's going to be close, it seems, from early uh, results. Uh, Abdullah Abdullah and Ashraf Ghani are facing off again. Uh, they're both members of the elite. right? They're both uh, seen as highly illegitimate by most of the Afghan people. And it'll be contested, and whoever comes out on top will probably be the one who cheated more or who gets the U.S. to back them, which is what's happened in the last three elections. And whenever this happens, you know, you'll hear lots of stories, right, lots of heroic yarns about people dipping their finger in ink and, you know, showing courage to vote in the face of Taliban threats. And that is all brave. But let's get down to the nuts and bolts of reality. 20% of Afghans went to the polls. 20% all-time low. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us a few things. We know that about half of Afghanistan is either in control, in the control, or being contested by the Taliban. So that does rule out a lot of people because of fear or because, let's be frank, lots of people in those areas support the Taliban, which is why they're able to hold on to power there, okay? Because in parts of Afghanistan I was in, in the south and in the east, the Taliban is like the home team, right? They, they grew up there. They like it. They're the, the people are the Taliban, right, in, in one form or another. And then 
that still leaves out the 50% of the country that is relatively peaceful or at least relatively under the control of the government. Well, why didn't those people come out? Why did less than half of those people come out? That's apathy. That is the feeling, and we see it in America on a smaller scale, a growing scale, though. The people, when they don't believe they have real choices, when the people believe that the people running, right, are just the same corporate mainstream politicians who are supporting the elites, right, whether it's Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump or George Bush and John Kerry, right, who all go to the same colleges and are all part of the same secret societies, or whether it's Abdullah Abdullah and Ashraf Ghani, right, both of whom uh, would be more comfortable in a Paris cafe than walking the streets of Kabul, right? That, that's who the Afghan people have to choose from. And so it tells us how illegitimate most a Afghan people find the U.S. back, the U.S. propped up government. And this is not really democracy, okay? When 20% of the people come out to vote in a civil war-ridden country that's occupied by a foreign power who ultimately, that's the U.S., who ultimately pulls the string, right? This is, this is a charade, too. This is the illusion of democracy, not the actuality of democracy, right? And, the illusion that Afghans have choice. Yes, but the reality and, is they only have choices that we give them. Uh, on the 18th anniversary coming up of Afghanistan, also, maybe they're not so sure about these choices because in recent history... Um, there's a book as well as a Hollywood movie of Charlie Wilson's War, a representative from Texas who, you know, with the corporations and the military industrial complex blessing, went to Afghanistan to aid supply funds and arms to the Mujahideen, which was the precursor to the modern Taliban. Now, Osama bin Laden, we all know, you know, is a big... Um, elite family, the Bin Ladens in Saudi Arabia, um, the number one promoter of Wahhabism, yet the Clinton Foundation wants to take donations from them, you know, and let them assassinate journalists in an embassy. Um, but we don't want to impeach for that, you know. We, I mean, we propped up Saddam in the Ba'ath Party against Iran in the eight-year war of Iran and Iraq. I mean, this is all repeating itself. And you wonder why maybe the Afghan people or the Iraqi people question their choices or know it's already, you know, rigged for whoever America's next puppet is going to be anyway. Well, what you're mentioning there is what I like to call inconvenient context. Americans don't really like context. It's not their favorite thing. United uh, States of amnesia. Right. And, and, and you notice, like, nobody's really talking about um, women in Afghanistan in the correct way. What I mean by that is these neocon and neoliberal zealots who keep telling us we have to stay in Afghanistan or, I don't know, the world is going to end, right? You ever notice that they don't talk about the fact that they themselves in the 1980s back to Mujahideen against the Soviet-backed socialist government of Afghanistan. Now, that socialist government of Afghanistan, while imperfect, as most authoritarian states tend to be, whether they are socialist in, in makeup or capitalist, that socialist Soviet-backed regime was the most progressive for women's rights and minority rights and religious secular freedom of any government Afghanistan has ever had. So don't tell me, Max Boot, Rachel Maddow, you know, the neoliberal to the neoconservative, you know, range of people, do not tell me we have to stay in Afghanistan in order to protect the poor Afghan women. This war was never about that. This war was about revenge first, ill-conceived revenge. Then it was about domination of resources and the projection of power. And ultimately, when there were no other reasons to stay, when nothing made sense, when no other justification existed, it had its inertia of its own. And the inertia, scientifically speaking, not my strong point, is driven by something. And it's driven by profit. And it's driven by our hyper-capitalist, extractionist system. And exactly. so now I find it incredibly obtuse for 
these people to say we have to stay for women's rights. And well, why? it's interesting, like, it, with the Taliban, like, say that we end up going back to the table with them. You know, they're going to have some pretty, uh, they're going to have some demands, right? And I, I mean, I feel like we might have to give up some of our Western ideals in order to create peace there, right? Like, we have to acknowledge the fact that the Taliban controls roughly half the country, right? Like, we wouldn't be able to move forward if we didn't realize that they have a very specific way of doing things. And while we may not agree with it as Americans with our Western values, what is the better outcome? Do we continue to stay there and prop up this, Ill this government that does nothing for its people and enriches themselves? Or... Do we try to move forward with a peace that may be hard for us to swallow as with our Western democratic ideals? You know, and that's, that I think is what is like the, the, the corporate media doesn't necessarily want to acknowledge. They don't want to acknowledge the fact that we might have to make some hard choices and some hard uh, concessions for peace in Afghanistan. And I don't believe um, these neoliberal talking point puppets on the corporate mainstream media, um, both on left and right, they realize that you're, when you, you know, you identify a certain group that you want to save, you're propagating the savior complex of manifest destiny, which is exactly what the imperialists and the corporate oligarchs in, that run the military industrial complex on a geopolitical level, that's what they want you to have is that blind nationalism. And even if maybe you're not on the right wing and don't have the rah, rah, waving American flag, but you're a neoliberal pundit on MSNBC or CNN, um, you're still hiding or giving the opportunity for the military industrial complex to commit further war crimes and profit on, um, you know, bombs and guns over people and just destroy and obliterate people of every shape, size, um, regardless. So I don't understand how they don't understand that we propagate torture and war crimes and violence more than anyone in the world. It's, um, it's a sad anniversary, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it's a sorrowful one. Um, I think all of us, you know, in, in kind of like wrapping this up slowly, I think all of us on the pod, obviously we're all soldiers, right? You know, we were, we were, we, were um, we used to carry water for the empire, as I like to say, we don't anymore. Now we fight the empire, but you know, it's easy to mourn the deaths of the 2,400 or so American soldiers who died in Afghanistan and then, you know, several uh, thousand who uh, lost limbs and, you know, tens of thousands wounded you know and, and we should we, we should remember that loss we should we should mourn the fact that in fighting an unjustified and unwinnable war we sacrifice so much blood and treasure but you know when we celebrate or commemorate this awful anniversary next week or on monday uh which is uh well you have to correct me on the date but it's in early october with the actual date um october uh 7th i believe you know we need to mourn the Afghan people because that's the real victims. We're talking hundreds of thousands, millions of deaths, actually, if you go back to when this war in Afghanistan started in 1973, because that's what we forget, right? I mean, America's always been involved. We've always been, like, fueling the conflict through our arms and money, but we've, we've only had troops on the ground for 18 out of the 46 years that Afghanistan has now been at war continually. Let us commemorate them. Let us mourn them. Okay, they're browner than Americans like to think of themselves. They're more Muslim than Americans like to admit, you know, or, or like to accept in this country. But they're human beings. And we are not alone in this. There are other players, other guilty people. But we are a major, if not the major factor that has fueled these near genocidal wars on Afghanistan. We're, you know, we, it's, a, it's a broken society. It's Humpty Dumpty. I, I'm not even certain it will ever be put back together again. I'm not certain that 50 years from now, Afghanistan is a coherent whole with its current borders ruled from Kabul. I just don't see it. 
it's going to fracture. We're talking about never ending civil war or maybe eventually some sort of truce that divides the country into an either two parts or a number of fiefdoms ruled by warlords, many of whom we've been backing since forever. This is the, this is the reality Afghans face. I, I, I have trouble looking an Afghan in the eye today, like an Afghan American. I was just on the real news network with um, uh, an Afghan American woman, woman's rights activist, very, very eloquent, brilliant woman. And, and, and we were just digitally, you know, streamed in, but I, it, it hurt me to like look at her face on the Skype in the corner while I was talking about how badly this is going to end for the Afghan people. I, I was embarrassed, you know, to, to, it was hard to look her in the eye because the crime that we've committed on the Afghans is inexcusable and unforgivable. And the thing is when we leave, which I think we should, that's going to be a crime too. Like it's not going to be happy ending. And yeah, maybe for our troops it is because they don't have to get bombed anymore. But we're going to leave a shambles behind. Now, I think we should go because I don't think it matters whether you leave in one day or one millennia. I think that's going to happen anyway, the travesty. But God, let us remember the Afghan people on this anniversary, Monday, October 6th. Yeah, I just want to... Well, Ryan, this was awesome, man. Yeah, I wanted to say thank you to Henry and Keegan and Danny for having me on. And I hope everybody listening uh, supports Fortress on the Hill. And also, I wanted to shout out the Peace Report again by Will Griffin. And hopefully some of the listeners will check out um, what he has to say. Keep fighting imperialism and keep fighting the military industrial complex. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. Come on, you good people, and listen to my song. I hope you'll pay attention. I will not